Well, good evening, church. Good to be with you guys tonight. Uh, if you are new with us or visiting, my name is Chad Kenser. I serve as our campus pastor and our preaching pastor here at Downtown PM, and a uh, privilege to worship with you. If you joined us this afternoon at Zilker Park uh, for kind of the hangout and uh, played some spike ball or uh, any of the other things we had going on with those like amazing like arrow frisbees, uh, I just now learned of those today, which says something about me, like I've been living under a rock. But you know those frisbees that like you can you barely touch and they go forever. We did that and it was awesome. Uh, and so if you joined us today at Zilker Park. Uh, Good to have you. If you didn't, you, you missed out. That's just how that works. But we're so glad that you're here uh, tonight. Um, if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open up to Exodus chapter 20. We'll be there in just a second tonight. We're in week uh, eight uh, of our journey through the Ten Commandments. So we're nearly finished. We're almost to the end. Uh, it's been a good little journey for us. And it bears, it bears repeating, and it's worth repeating tonight, that when we're thinking about the Ten Commandments, what we've been looking at over the last uh, eight weeks is God's word to his freed people. So the context of the Ten Commandments is not God just shows up randomly and starts handing out rules to people in Morality 101. That, that's not how it works, even though that's sometimes how we think about Christianity. The context of the Ten Commandments is God has rescued his people from slavery. God has loved his people, delivered his people, and now that he has set them free, he's now speaking to them in a way that will shape them and form them as his own people in a way that they might flourish and live together uh, with him and with one another. That, that, that's what's going on in Ten Commandments. They are words of freedom and words of flourishing, not rules uh, to sort of, you know, compare yourself to where you are in the morality chart, right? And, and so as we've had over the past few weeks, I mean, God has spoken to several different topics, right? Things that we care about, things that we have questions about. So from the beginning, uh, the first four commandments are about our relationship with God, but then it moves on into command four, where God's even addressing how we should see our work and how that should frame up a given week for us and how to, to measure our days. We go from there and God speaks about the issue of family and honor your mother and father. From there, he speaks to the issue of anger and of, of flourishing of life and the command do not murder. He goes on to speak about sexuality. Uh, he God's touching a lot of hot topics, worship, family, anger, sexuality. And tonight is no different. He's going to address yet another topic that we care much about, the issue of money, the issue of possessions, right? And so what we're seeing in the Ten Commandments, kind of last word of introduction, is uh, that, that all of life is, is connected back to God. There's not an area of life that God leaves unaddressed. There's not an area of life that we can compartmentalize and say, here's my life with God over here, and then here's my other stuff. What he's saying in the Ten Commandments is that everything has to do with me, and nothing of life is disconnected from me. And that's good for us. That is good for us, right? And so tonight I want us to look at the Eighth Commandment in Exodus 20, verse 15. Uh, so I want to begin our time together. And the way I want to do so is read Exodus 20, 1 and 2, just to remind us where the commands are coming from. And then we'll skip to verse 15 and read our command tonight. And so if you've got a Bible, the words will be uh, in there in your text, obviously. But if you don't have a Bible, the words will be on the screen behind me. Exodus chapter 20. Beginning in verse 1, the word of Christ speaks like this. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Tonight, when my wife got here to church, she told me that uh, when she was bringing our kids tonight, our two older daughters and our, our son, the youngest, he's eight months old, she said that my, my oldest, five-year-old daughter, Liv asked, why, why does daddy always have to go to church so much earlier than us? And she said, well, because he's going to preach tonight. And she says, preach? What's preach? And my wife said, well, he's going to tell people about Jesus. And tonight we're going to talk about stealing. And she goes, oh, I get it. Dad's going to talk about bandits tonight. Uh, kind of. So just kind of prepare yourself where we're headed, right? Um, pretty funny moment, but honestly, as I studied the passage this week, it had me thinking about, it called my mind back to the, really the first time that I ever felt the sting of guilt. Like the first time in my life where I ever felt like I, I just did something wrong and I might be wrong as a person. I was eight or nine years old. My family had just kind of moved to a new town. We were new in the neighborhood. I didn't know any Anybody, I was getting to know the neighborhood kids, and as is the case with basically any eight or nine-year-olds, the thing to do is ride bikes. 
And so in my neighborhood, I kind of joined the biker gang of eight and nine-year-olds, and it was awesome. We were rough. And uh, I noticed quickly that to have street cred in my neighborhood when it came to your bike game, uh, you had to not only have a nice bike, but it was all about the way you customized it. It's all about kind of the customization of your bike and the prized sort of customized accessory on the bikes were what we called chromies. I asked a few people this week if they'd ever heard of chromies or if they ever heard that word before and people kind of looked at me like I was a big idiot. So maybe we were the only ones in the world on my street that used the term chromie. But what it was were, you know, the little like caps on the valve stem of your tire? They're chrome ones. So they're not little black rubber ones, they're they're chromies, people, right? They're, they're chrome <laughs> valve stem caps. And that was like, man, you, you had a bike if you had chromies, you know? Well, I didn't have chromies. And all my friends did, and it was the thing to have. And so I went home, and I said to my mom, hey, I, clearly I need chromies. Uh, she looked at me and said, that's ridiculous. Don't talk about that ever again. You're not getting those things. You're going to stick with your little black rubber tire caps. Uh, thus, I become a thief. Enter thievery, right? So I had a friend I was getting, uh, you know, becoming one of my best friends on the street, and I was over at his house all the time, and I noticed in his bedroom he had two chromies. Beware, I'm not going to say chromies the whole sermon, right? So he had two chromies sitting next to his bed in a bowl. And I remember when I saw them that day, I, I had like this intense, intense like rush of jealousy and like, like rage and I've got to have those come over me. Like I was flushed with desire and it was so bizarre. And my friend already had chromies. He didn't need two extra ones, you know? So I had kind of set it in my mind that the next time I had a chance when he was out of his room and I was there, those, those were mine. That that's what was gonna happen, I was gonna take them. And so sure enough, the next time his mom called him out of the room and I was there at the house, I walked right over to that bowl I put them in my pocket and my heart was pounding. I had a cold sweat, but I felt awesome because I had chrome valve stem caps, you know? I remember going home pretty quick, like, oh, I gotta go, I gotta get out of here. Uh, to my friend, I went home and I put them on my bike and it was incredible. A few days later, we're hanging out together and uh, my friend noticed. He's like, hey, you got chromies? Yeah, yeah, I did. And he goes, man, I had some by my bedside. I can't find them anymore. I, this makes me so mad. And I remember at that moment, everything landed on me. Like, you, you're a bad person, you know? This is your only friend in the neighborhood, and you're stealing his stuff. And so I resolved that day to have integrity. I went home, I took them off, and I returned them just like I found them. I didn't say anything about it. Just kind of put them back in the bowl, you know? And, and I remember later on going, hey, man, I found your chromies. And uh, he goes, yeah, I don't know where they are. I didn't see them there. I was an eight-year-old, right? Like, I didn't, have, I didn't have this robust ethical framework. But I was eight, and I knew instinctively that what I did was wrong. I just knew instinctively, and I think all of us can testify to that. Like, you don't have to have, like, all the framework in the world or to have Exodus chapter 20, verse 15 memorized to know that that's not how you're supposed to live with people. That's not how you share life with people. And so when God's coming forward in the eighth command and telling us, do not steal, what he's doing is he's speaking to that innate sense that all of us have, and he's telling us where it comes from. Why, why is it that we're wired up this way? And even if we've disregarded our conscience here, why we know even in that moment that we've done something wrong. He's telling us where that comes from and how it should shape us as his people. And so this command comes to us. This command comes to us uh, in the same way that like two weeks ago, the, the do not murder command came to us. Where you kind of read it and you go, yeah, that's a clear moral boundary. Uh, I don't know if I need the Bible to say that. This command kind of hits us that way. I get it, do not steal. I don't think I have to, to spend time with anybody in the room or anybody in our city to, to argue with them, to convince them, hey, stealing is a bad thing. Every, everyone sort of gets that. And that's one of the ways that we were pointed toward the truthfulness of God's word. When, when you, with, even without God's word, have his law written on your heart by instinct, it testifies to the goodness and the wisdom of God's word. And so God is talking to us tonight about our possessions, about our money, and how it is that we acquire them. And there's some of you in the room tonight, 
and you've been on the other side of the issue. You know what it's like to be stolen from. You know what it's like to be robbed. And so when you hear this, maybe even you're thinking as I've been talking about this, about your experience and you've got it rolling through your mind and, and for you there's an all too tangible sense, there's a far more visceral sense of the frustration and the anger and, and the injustice, the sense of injustice, it hits you personally. And so the reason that stealing is wrong isn't because we just love our stuff and we don't want people messing with it. That's part of it. The reason that stealing is wrong isn't that we've just kind of established a social norm together that like, oh yeah, uh, life together would be a lot better if we didn't do that. What makes stealing wrong has everything to do again with what we talked about a couple of weeks ago and do not murder. All of our sort of relational ethics are tied back to the fact that we were created in the image of God, that we bear the image of God, that he made us to sort of be icons to show what he is like, how he is, and what his character looks like even through our life. And so as image bearers of God, when we steal, we're saying something about God, that he's not a provider, that he can't meet the needs of his people. We're saying something about ourselves, that, that we know better how to meet our needs than God does, and so we're gonna provide for ourselves. That's what we're saying in stealing. And so as image bearers of God, in all of us, there's this desire, there's this hunger to have stuff and to care for stuff. And that desire has been placed there by God because that's part of what it means to be human. It's part of what it means to be an image bearer. You think about who it is that we're imaging. We're imaging God who is the owner of everything and who is the keeper of all things. So naturally those who would be in his image would, would desire to have stuff and to care for stuff. And to show you what I mean, it goes back to the very, very beginning in the garden. Go back to Genesis chapter 2 if you have a Bible. Genesis chapter 2. God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, and it wasn't a perfectly manicured garden. God placed them there and gave them the task to have it and to care for it. I'll show you in Genesis 2, verse 5. It says, When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. Okay, so this is pre-creation of man. Now, go down to verse 15. He says, so the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it, to have it and to care for it. And so God placed Adam and Eve in the garden with responsibility to cultivate the garden. He tells them there to fill it and subdue it in chapter one and to make it a place where they can carry out the mission that God gave them to be fruitful and multiply. And so in the garden, God gave Adam and Eve everything they possibly needed and everything they could possibly want to carry out the mission of flourishing the earth. But they were going to take possession of that by having the garden and caring for it. They were stewards, they were caretakers of God's creation. This is, again, what it means to be an image bearer. And so every single one of us, this isn't just an Adam and Eve thing, this is an all of us thing. We've all been made to be stewards, to be caretakers of the things that we have. And so every one of you have possessions. Every one of you have things that are yours. And there's a responsibility for you to care for the things that are yours. Every one of you have possessions that are precious to you. And there's no wonder they are because you were made to have things and to care for them. Right? And so when you think on down to the issue that God has given us creation to care for and to have it. This is a desire he's given us. This is why we, we enjoy uh, having new clothes and new possessions and acquiring new things. We, we were made for this. So having stuff isn't bad. It was designed that way by God. But here's the problem. In our sin and in our brokenness, we've taken these God-given desires and we've turned them in on ourselves and made them about us. And so what we've done is we've replaced God as the highest possession, as the highest treasure with stuff. As though it's better to have stuff and it's better to have things and it's better to have these things that we can touch and we can feel than it is to have a God who cares for us that we know who is real but is yet invisible. So we'll replace him with stuff. Every one of us have done this. And when we've done this, we've broken the sixth, the eighth commandment. Because every, every, every flowing out of wrong worship, replacing God with other things, leads us to the feeling of necessity that I've got to have what I want, when I want it, however the heck I can get it. And 
So in the eighth commandment, every one of us have broken it. And we've broken it in two ways. All of us are guilty of both. There's the more traditional sense that we're familiar with of wrong taking, taking something that isn't yours. But there's the much more subtle, not so obvious form of stealing that all of us are also guilty of, of wrong keeping. And we'll talk about that one in a moment, but both are theft. So wrong taking, right? Wrong taking. This is, this is the, this is the more, most basic sense of what it is to steal. Someone has something that isn't yours, but you want it, and you take it from them uh, without asking, without them knowing, without their permission. You take it from them and have it as your own. This is, this is wrong taking. You possessing something not belonging to you, but belonging to someone else. The most traditional sense of this, we think about robbers and breaking and entering. We think about scams where people deceive someone to take from them. This is the most traditional sense of what it means to do this. This happens on high levels and on, on low levels, but there's also, there's also a far more subtle sense that I think hits all of us to the core. Because even if you've stolen in some of those larger ways, all of us have stolen in smaller ways that we don't think is actually stealing in ways that we want to justify and rationalize. Because there's a way you can steal from someone that feels very personal. And you don't want to do that. But there's another way you you can steal from a larger they, a larger them, that doesn't feel so personal that sometimes we don't even think of as stealing. So for example, this is getting music without paying for it. Oh man, you're gonna talk about that tonight, right? This is finding a way to have music without paying for it. You say, oh, here's the deal, man. It's not like I'm hurting anybody when I illegally download some songs. It's not like the artist is getting hurt. It's not like the community is getting hurt around me. I didn't want the whole album. I just wanted a few songs. Like, I'm not, I'm not, like, jacking a whole album. People out there are doing that, like, on end. But, like, I just wanted a few songs. Yeah, but do you realize that the mentality of, of that kind of getting music without paying for it has changed the entire industry? Yeah, but the industry was corrupt in the first place, so now making it, like, downloadable and more accessible is the only reasonable thing to do. Do you see already our logic that we're willing to negotiate and justify whatever it is that we want and however it is that we want to have, however we can get it? We will justify and negotiate all the way down. And I get this logic. I've done it too. But it's theft. It is. You're taking something that belongs to someone else as your own, however you see fit to get it. And what you're doing when you start negotiating and justifying, you're propping yourself up as an ethical standard and by de facto making yourself God and other people play by your rules. That's what's happening. Another way we do this, very, very subtly, I'm just giving you a couple of examples. One I've done many, many times. You go to a fast food restaurant and you order water only to get soda, right? You laugh to keep from crying because you know it's true, right? <laughs> We've done this many, many times. And so here's my logic oftentimes is, listen, I don't agree with the price of soda, $29.50 for a medium? That's ridiculous. I don't have that kind of cash. I'm not going to places that cost $29.50 for a medium, right? But you get the point. The price of soda is too high. I don't have that kind of cash. And they have plenty of soda to go around. My little one water cup of soda isn't going to hurt the restaurant. And so I move on justify it and I have my, my meal. I feel like I got away with something. They don't know, but I got dark drink in that cup, you know? Now here's the deal, right? All of us think that's not stealing because what stealing would be in our mind is walking over to another table with other people, grabbing someone else's cup that they clearly paid for and just right in front of them uh, in broad daylight, taking their cup, looking at them with some sort of mischievous laughter in our voice and then walking over to the fountain and getting my Coke and saying, deal with it, people. That's stealing in our minds, not what we've done with the water cup. You see, what we want to do all the time is we want to justify and negotiate our sin to continue on what we're doing. That I'm going to have what I want, when I want, the way I want it, with whatever ethics I have on getting it. That's what we do. And so what we'll do is we'll negotiate our sin to no end and continue to feel better about ourselves while pointing the finger at other people who are doing worse stuff. That's not me. And so I could go on with example after example. That's just two easy ones of ways that we take things we haven't paid for and ways we've taken more than we paid for and didn't say anything about it. Right? 
So on the one hand, they're stealing by wrong taking. That's clear. But on the other hand, they're stealing by wrong keeping. And this is when we rob God, steal from God. So the command comes to us in the frame of a negative statement. Do not steal, like stay away from doing something. But it's not only a negative statement. God's also assuming and God's also saying something positive and pushing us in a direction of life. He's, he's calling us toward generosity. So God's goal for you isn't that you just don't steal stuff. If that was the case, that's somewhat of an easy life to live. Well, why do I need God for that? But God's after far more. He's after generosity. Remember, we're image bearers. And so when we live our life a certain way, we're saying something about God and about ourselves. And there's no greater statement you can make about God, no more truthful expression you can display about God than generosity. That's who he is at his core. He's a generous God. He's created, he's given, he's nurtured, he's kept, he's sustained, he's moved. He's, he's generous at his core. But we're also saying something about us in generosity. You see, there's not a thing that you have and there's not a thing that you are that you have acquired by yourself and that you have developed by yourself. Everything that you are and everything that you have has been given to you by God for his glory. Just sit on that a little bit tonight. Everything that you have and everything that you are wasn't self-acquired, it wasn't self-made, it was given to you by God and for God. Now, some of you, maybe you're thinking, no, 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 I've worked for what I have. I, I, I've worked for the things that I have true for many of you in the room but there's a bigger question going on there everything even been given to you through that is for God and given by God so maybe you've worked for everything you have but who gave you the body with the ability and the health to work maybe you came from a fortunate family that's given you lots of things and you have you have the blessings of coming from a well-off family who gave you that family Maybe you have an intellect and a social savvy that you can navigate relationships really well in a way that's afforded you certain opportunities, that's given you certain blessings. Well, who gave you that intellect and who gave you that social savvy? You see, everything is coming from God and for God. And the greatest way we can honor God with the things he has given us isn't to hold them in on ourselves with closed fists, but it's to open them saying they've, they've been given to me freely and I want to be generous for God's purposes and for God's glory with the things that have come to me. We don't have to hold on to stuff. We have a generous father who's pleased to give. And so one of the ways we dishonor God is by hanging on to our things when his purposes are at stake and he's called us toward things and we rob him by wrong keeping. This is what Malachi talks about. In Malachi chapter three, the prophet comes along and he addresses God's people this way. He says, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and in your contributions. Hey, hey notice, notice the language in this. He, he's mentioning tithes, but this isn't necessarily a giving to the church kind of, kind of verse. This is coming in the broader context of God's people disobeying God and their generosity. And so the prophet comes forward to say, you're robbing God by not holding openly what he has freely given you. You're robbing him. And so, so the language is, is very specific. He doesn't say you're stingy. He doesn't say you're cheap. He says you're robbing me. And why? Because listen, if... If what you have was self-acquired, if what you had was sort of self-made with no other help behind it, then generosity is on the table for you. However you want to be generous, it's negotiable, it's just on you. If, it, if, it's, if it's up to your discretion how you give. But listen, if what you have belongs to someone else and has been given to you by them, namely God, then generosity is no longer negotiable. That when you've been commanded to be generous and yet you haven't, you have robbed the one who has given you what you have, namely God. And so when you turn your possessions in on yourself as though they're for you and for your purposes and they have no business of, of God and God has no jurisdiction to tell you how to use your money or how to use your possessions, then what you're saying is I'm okay with robbing God and that's wrong keeping. 
every one of us, it's clear that God's given us spiritual things like hope and forgiveness. He's given us grace and, and peace. The spiritual things are clear. Those are from God. But very often we forget that our material possessions, those come from God too. Those come from God too. God is the giver of everything. So just examine yourself here on wrong keeping. How do you see your money? How do you see your resources? Do they belong to God? Does God have any right to say how you would use them? Do you see your resources as an opportunity to serve the poor and the marginalized? Do you see your resources as an opportunity to take the gospel to the nations through the sending of missionaries? I'm not saying that your resources haven't been given to you to provide for your needs. They certainly have been. But do you see your, your resources and do you see your possessions, do you see your money as ending on you, as only for you? You say, no, I, I give stuff. Okay, so here's a question on giving then. What values are swirling about in your head that determine what you will and what you won't give? Are those values you have made and you've put parameters on or are those values God has established and he's free, he's free to shape them? You see, does God have any say in how you give? You see, if he doesn't, then, then this is wrong keeping. This is wrong keeping. And, and so here's the thing in the end, right? Money, money's this really tricky, this really tricky animal for all of us. And it will be to the day we drop because it presents this unique challenge to us. Because it comes to us with this appearance of being able to provide for us everything that God has promised to us, but we can go get it without any need for God and we can have it right when we want, the way we want. So money wants to come to you and say, hey, you want approval? You want people to like you? You just get enough of me and people will treat you the way you want to be treated. You want comfort? You just get enough money and you can have as many creature comforts as you want. You can have cars and vacations and houses and you can have as many sleep aids as you want and you can be as comfortable as you want with enough money. You, you want power? You have enough money and money can buy you the influence and the platform and the significance you want. You want control? You have enough money and you're able to have stability and security in a way that you don't have to worry about the future. See, all the things that we feel as needs that God has wired in us for us to recognize him through approval and comfort and power and control, money says, no, 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 you don't need God for those things. Here, here it is. So very often what we end up doing is we replace God with money and we sprinkle our worship of God on top of it to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. And so here's what ends up happening. We end up pursuing money and trusting money and having a respect and a reverence for money in ways that we were made to pursue God and trust God and have a reverence for God. And so every wrong worship turns into a breaking of God's commands. Our wrong taking and our wrong keeping flow from a wrong worship of money instead of God. And so we might say it this way. When you break the eighth commandment through wrong, wrong keeping and wrong taking, you're also breaking the first commandment of having no other gods before you. You see, here what's crazy about the commandments, they expose us in ways that it shows us we're worse than we thought we were. <laughs> but here's also the good news. God hasn't given us his commands, church, to crush us. He hasn't. He hasn't given us his commands to crush us. He's given us his commands to show us just how badly we need him, only for him to step in and meet that need. And so it's right in the middle of all of this that God shows off his greatness to us in ways that are way bigger than the Red Sea. You see, God comes to us to save us. He comes to us to change us. He comes to us to, to rescue us from our law breaking. And here's how he does it at the eighth command. He does it by outgiving us. He rescues us from do not steal and law breaking to outgiving us. You think about it. 
God comes to us in his son Jesus to save us, not by giving us greater demands on stealing and money, not by giving us punishment and lashings. He gives us by radical acts of sacrificial generosity to rescue us from breaking the law of do not steal. He opens up our clenched fists by the outpouring of his own open hands. Here's the way Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He says it this way, starting in verse 7. He says, but as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, as you excel in earnestness and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, to put, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is also genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that by his poverty you might become rich. So notice what Paul does here. He exhorts the church and he encourages the church, not by telling them what they ought to do, but by showing them what Jesus has already done. The wealthy son of God, the, the rich son of God of heaven, stepped down to join us and he became poor that we might become rich. He became poor before God that we might become rich before God. The king became a commoner with us and he experienced his greatest poverty when he subjected himself to a death deserved for sinners and thieves like you and me. And he underwent the judgment of God you and I would never have to know that. He subjected himself to the poverty of the judgment of God and was stripped of everything so that you and I would never have to know the judgment of God and we would have all things with God. What kind of love is this? What kind of God is this that would come to us who have stolen from him and would not steal from us but would actually give even more to us? So if the death of Jesus in your place isn't astounding enough to you, the Bible goes even farther still. And he shows us that it wasn't just that he died in our place, but he actually went forward and he died with thieves. So the Gospel of Luke records the crucifixion of Jesus this way. Luke 23, beginning in verse 32. It says, two others who are criminals were led away to be put to death with him. The other gospels tell us that the criminals put to death with Jesus were thieves, robbers. Verse 33, it says, when they came to the place of the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You see this, the son of God submitting himself to not actually die a sinner's death, but to die with sinners, namely thieves, to be counted with them. What love and humility. It keeps going. Verse 39, it says, One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Verse 42, and this thief said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. So church, tonight as we wrap this thing up, we think about the eighth command, do not steal. I want us to think about the eighth command in light of the cross of Christ. Because the question tonight isn't whether or not you're a thief. That's already been settled. The question tonight is which thief are you? Which thief are you? You see, there's two different thieves here, and they respond very differently to Jesus. One rebukes him and mocks him. The other cries out for mercy and asks, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And so are you here tonight like the one thief who's hearing this sermon, and it's, yeah, 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 I've heard that before. I'm not that bad. I didn't need Jesus to die for me here. It's not like I'm going to go out and rob a bank. Or 
Are you hearing this sermon and you recognize your life before God and you see the crucified Son of God? And is there a heart in you that says, God, would you have mercy on me and remember me when you come into your kingdom? You see, because whoever you are and wherever you are in that, the truth is this. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And on the one hand, if you want to mock and scoff, judgment will land on your head forever. But on the other, by the grace of God, if you call out for mercy to the Son of God, judgment will land not on your head, but on the head of Christ. And he will take the shame of your robbery, he will take the shame of your theft, and you will take the grace and the blessings of being a law keeper and a son of God inheriting the kingdom of God and standing clean before God. You see, church, I want us to be a people who hear the word of God and we trust the son of God. That his word, his life, his death, and his resurrection are everything to us. So we want to take it seriously and, and actually understand we need his mercy. We need it. So where is God convicting you tonight of wrong taking? Where have you wrongly taken? And where it's in your power to do so would the gospel of grace compel you to return it if it's in your power to do so? But also where is... Where is the Spirit convicting you tonight of wrong keeping? Things that rightly belong to God, but you're turning in on yourself, saying he has no voice over this. May God shape us to be a people with a heart of generosity, just like his. Let's pray together. Father, Pray now in the only name that lets us pray, Jesus, your son, that you would forgive us where we have stolen. God, would you forgive us where we have stolen from others? Would you forgive us where we've stolen from you? Would you forgive us where we have proclaimed a false gospel in our stealing that you're a father who doesn't know how to provide for his kids? Would you forgive us, God? We want to confess together that you know exactly how to provide. You always provide. You've never not provided, and you will always provide because that's the kind of generous God you are. Would you make us a generous people? God, would you give us the grace that our lives would not be marked by theft, but by generosity, marked by Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in the room tonight who hear this message and there's a load of guilt on them because of things that they've done that they're massively ashamed of I pray that they would hear the cross of Jesus and understand that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus that what defines us ultimately is not theft but what defines us ultimately is the cross and the resurrection of Jesus and by that we're made sons and daughters of God Father, pierce us and shape us tonight as your people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's stand and sing.